All right, next up, we've got Mark Fancher from All Right Even Jude. Welcome, Mark. Hello. So uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. I'm uh, currently a senior motion designer at a studio based outside of Dallas called Artie Bin Chewed, and um, we I mainly specialize in working in Houdini there, and um, I also do the uh, I also do a course with MoGraph.com called Stop Being Afraid of Houdini. So I'm uh, instructing that sort of after hours, um, answering questions and stuff like that. And um, during the day, I'm working in Houdini pretty much full time. So uh, stop being afraid of Houdini. Do you see a lot of people afraid of Houdini out there? Well, you know, it's kind of funny because like at least in motion design circles, it seems like uh, there's a lot of users who are really comfortable in Cinema 4D but want to achieve these level of effects that are really um, hard to do without a lot of plugins or hard to do without just Houdini in the first place. And I think like there's this stigma that the learning curve is really high and all that stuff with Houdini. And I think that part of the philosophy is that, you know, Houdini is – a tool that gets you to a final result. That result should be what scares you. Um, if you're going to be creating something massively complex, that's the part that's scary. I don't think that the tool itself is scary, just like how uh, pen and paper, pen and paper is a really simple concept for a lot of people to understand. It's, it's simple, there's nothing scary about pen and paper. You can draw a smiley face with it, or you could you know, come up with general relativity and be uh, the next Einstein or whatever. You know, It's all about the tool um, being as easy as it is for you to get to these crazy results that you're after. So that's sort of what my kind of philosophy is about Houdini. <laughs> when I first joined the company uh, uh, years ago, uh, I heard this steep learning curve, steep learning curve, steep learning curve. And, and so uh, one of my goals over time has been to, uh, like yourself, make it more approachable, make it, it's just another uh, software application that that you have to learn just like any other software application. You, you start with learning the interface, then do something simple, then do something less simple, then the next level, and the next level. It, it's it's uh, stages just like any other piece of software. Yeah, totally. And I think like one of the things is a lot of people find nodes to be really intimidating. Like, oh my gosh, like what are all these wires hooking together? And like, honestly. You know, having been in both types of apps for a while, I've, I've worked in Maya and Cinema 4D and um, Houdini, I think that it's actually more apparent in Houdini to see what somebody did to achieve a certain effect. If you open up their project file, you get a flowchart that is a logical order of operations, tells you exactly all the steps a person took and in what order to get to the desired result. And I think with a lot of these hierarchical applications where everything's buried in menus and stuff like that, that apparent, that connectivity is not as apparent as it is in Houdini. So I really think it's about, you know, yeah, a big node tree can be kind of scary to look at at first, but really, if you think about it, it's, it's all laid out for you. So there's nothing to really worry about. You just got to take your time and go node by node and just see what was done to get to a certain result. And I think that once you kind of get past that fear of, you know, node trees and, and a fear of a new workflow, you actually see that you're just taking a bunch of really small steps to get to something really beautiful at the end, you know? Yeah, thanks. Um, and so today, uh, your presentation, what, uh, what are you going to be covering? So I think uh, what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to, um, you know, briefly, I'll, I'll be talking a little bit more about um, sort of my approach to Houdini. And then um, I'm going to be going into uh, doing some breakdowns of some work that we've done at already been chewed lately. Um, a lot of, I think what, uh, happens in motion graphics is we work really fast and we have to come up with tricky solutions to get around, um, issues that we can't fully troubleshoot. Um, so I'll kind of, um, focus on a little bit of some of the hacks that I've come up with to kind of get around a uh, tight turnaround. Um, when you got to just sort of art direct something because like a uh, art director's got like a crazy request and you just have to make it so um, without maybe re-simulating something 10,000 times to get it to land exactly right. So I'm going to kind of do that in the context of breaking down some of uh, the projects that we've worked on um, and kind of go over some of that stuff. Right on. Well, looking forward to it. Let's jump in. Cool. Thanks. Hello, everybody, and thanks for uh, joining me today. My name is Mark Fancher, and I am a senior motion designer at a studio 
uh, based outside of Dallas called Already Been Chewed. So a little bit about me. Um, like I said, I'm a senior motion designer. Um, I do mostly work in Houdini, but a lot of work in Cinema 4D and uh, After Effects as well. Um, I'm also the creator of the uh, Stop Being Afraid of Houdini course, uh, which is available on MoGraph.com. Um, a little bit more is uh, I'm a self-taught generalist background. It's been a little over 10 years now that I've been studying and working in computer graphics on my own. And um, it is absolutely 100% my obsession, my hobby, and thankfully now my career, finally. <laughs> um, so my uh, journey now finds me working in Houdini full-time for the past three years, which is a really great place to be. And so I just wanted to share a little bit of my personal work so you can get more of a kind of a sense of what types of things I am doing with Houdini. So here's that. All right, so I just wanted to talk about the studio that I work at. Um, Already Been Chewed is a motion design studio based out of Dallas, and um, we work with all sorts of clients in sports apparel, etc. We do a lot of work that involves product launches and promo graphics and uh, product visualizations and stuff like that. So we are a team of generalist specialists. Um, there are about 11 of us, and... Everyone sort of has a superpower, and then everyone can also kind of do a little bit of everything. So um, it is a really fun and collaborative group, and uh, it's been honestly just a great time uh, working there so far. So this is a couple images of our new studio space. You can see we got a nice basketball with a TV on the backboard, um, some cool signage, a lot of graffiti, uh, bricks. And up there in the right-hand corner is the man with the plan, my boss, Mr. Barton Damer. He's also the founding artist and creative director of Already Been Chewed. It's it's really funny. We just finished renovating this place probably two weeks before the whole coronavirus thing went down, but um, I can't wait to get back in there, uh, hopefully soon. And so uh, just to get a little bit uh, better of an idea of what kind of work we do at Already Been Chewed, um, here is the Already Been Chewed reel.
So you can see we do like a lot of product videos, watches, launches, sports related stuff. Um, and yeah, it's really fun place. Lots of variety. All right. So what are we going to be talking about today? First, uh, what I wanted to do is just briefly touch on uh, my some of my philosophies about how you should learn Houdini. Uh, since I do have a course, I figured I might as well talk about it for a second. Um, and, you know, kind of also touch on some of the challenges that people face with the software. And then uh, later on, I wanted to dive into some of the problems that have come up for me when I'm working in design. Um, and some of the solutions I've come up with to get a project over the finish line in sort of a polished way. Um, so first things first, Houdini is easy. I say this all the time and my coworkers give me a little bit of crap every now and then when they know something they're asking for is going to be super hard for me to do. They just say, but I thought Houdini was easy. <laughs> and, um, so I eat my words from time to time, but, um, I'm here now to double down and say that Houdini really is, is easy and I mean it <laughs> like for real, it's easy. Um, the fact of the matter is that Houdini is just a tool and it can be used to do easy things or it can be used to do complicated things. Um, just like that example that I mentioned earlier, I think in my intro about pen and paper, um, just remember that um, you're the one who got yourself into the mess of having to do a Phoenix water horse backflip explosion. It's not Houdini's fault. <laughs> so things to keep in mind, Houdini is a sandbox. I think um, many people are actually kind of afraid of the critical thinking and outside the box type mindset you have to have when um, approaching such an open-ended sandbox like software. I think like one of the things that um, frightens a lot of people is a blank page. You know, it's, you have almost too many options of something that you can do. And I think that, you know, just sitting around and, and working in Houdini and going through tutorials and learning things and repetition, you eventually get used to like what types of combo moves you can use to accomplish certain tasks. And, um, I think that, you know, you'll eventually get into that kind of sandbox mindset. Um, the more experience you have with it, you just have to be kind of patient and give yourself some time to get there. Um, next thing is, uh, maybe slow down a little bit. Um, I think a lot of people have a made, like feel this major pressure and this major rush to have Houdini fully learned and be making insane Sims day one. And that's absolutely just not how learning Houdini works. Um, I think that if you do dive right into the deep end and start learning Vex right away, you might overwhelm yourself and get frustrated. Uh, whereas if you'd taken like a more, um, you know, step-by-step -step approach, easing yourself into the software, learning the interface, learning some of the basic SOPS nodes before getting into simulation, stuff like that, I think is all like, you know, really important to kind of, uh, you know, help your approach feel more, more fluid and, and ease yourself into it. Um, the next thing is, um, remember, it's not the tool that's difficult. It's the project that's difficult. Uh, when you see a beautiful painting, you know, at a museum or something, nobody thinks, oh my gosh, like how did they learn paintbrushes? I mean, that's amazing. It's, it's really not a paint. There's nothing amazing about a paintbrush. Um, what, what is amazing is what people are able to do with the tools that they have. And that's sort of on you. That's your responsibility. Um, you know, I think that this is sort of, um, kind of a thing that plagues our industry at least a little bit. It's people obsessing over what tools somebody used to make something. Um, you know, oh, did you use, uh, did you, what render engine did you use? How much, what was the render time? Um, at the end of the day, is the image look beautiful? Um, yeah, and it probably doesn't matter what render engine they use because the artist is good enough at whatever software they're using to make a beautiful image that makes you happy when you look at it. And lastly, remember that you still have to be an artist. This kind of goes back to what I was saying in the paintbrush example, but I fall into this trap all the time. I'll sim something and I'll, I'll think I'm going to sim this. I'm going to let the computer do all the work and it's going to look amazing. Um, but that isn't always, you know, the case. Uh, for example, um, Brian, our lead animator at Already Been Chewed, he works mostly in vanilla Cinema 4D, but people assume a lot of the shots that come out are uh, that, that he produces that he they're assuming that they were made in Houdini. And I think that that's because Houdini has sort of the word Houdini has sort of mutated 
into an industry buzzword for quality. While it seems you may have an advantage in our industry if you do know Houdini, um, I don't think it's 100% a golden ticket. Uh, you still have to be, you still have to make pretty and polished results in, at the end of the day. And that's kind of what the rest of my speech is about. Fixing crappy renders you made in five seconds in Houdini. And that's sort of why I'm calling it motion design hacks. Um, I call them hacks because I'm not entirely sure if they're the most efficient way to do whatever it is that I'm trying to do, but they seem pretty straightforward for me and hopefully they don't feel too convoluted to you. So I pulled this quote uh, that I think is pretty great and this has to do with com computer programming and coding, but the quote is the first 90% of the code accounts for the first 90% of the development time. Then the remaining 10% of the code accounts for the other 90% of the development time. Uh, more or less when you translate this into a uh, 3d language, it's yeah, you, you know, setting up the initial prototype might take you, you know, a couple hours and it feels really satisfying. And then I feel like the other 90% of the time that you're working on a project, you're actually just troubleshooting what went wrong with your initial prototype and trying to get it to work, dealing with render issues, missing frames, all that stuff. It's, it's a lot of troubleshooting. So that kind of brings me into what challenges we face as, in motion design when we're trying to make, uh, when we're trying to use Houdini and use simulations to make our, um, make our animations. So sims are glitchy and erratic, but we need smooth motion. A lot of times I'll like run into a RBD sim and it's kind of glitching. The collisions are a little bit glitchy or the movement is a little bit glitchy. So that's one of the challenges that we have is kind of smoothing out some of these sim issues. Um, sims also tend to have a life of their own and we need to art direct them. This is sort of one of the things Houdini's famous for is its art direct ability. Um, your ability to kind of get in there and have control over literally anything. Um, other challenges, we have a lot of fast turnarounds in motion design. So a lot of the, uh, you know, fixing the glitches and stuff, that's actually going to happen post sim versus re sim. So instead of, oh, re simming this thing, what we're going to do is we're going to find every possible way we can avoid rerunning the long simulation and just try to fix it, you know, fix the cache data, you know, if we can. Um, and then also good enough is a relative term. I think that in um, a lot of these tricks that we're doing will work for maybe commercials or product launches or something like that, but they might not be suitable for, um, for like a film project or something like that. And I think also, you know, having not worked in film, I'm not entirely sure, but I think that, you know, there might be some things that uh, you could get away with in film that you absolutely can't get away with in uh, motion design. So I think it's all sort of relative depending on what perspective you're coming at, but I'll mostly be focusing on the motion design end of it. In fact, entirely today. So, all right. So the first example is going to be going over polishing effects and um, the, basically what we did, what we're going to look at is a technique I developed for a recent project. And that was more or less to um, illustrate a Bluetooth connection. So we get a project where the goal is to show Bluetooth connectivity between two objects. And one of them was a phone and the other one shall remain nameless. Um, but when I'm brief, I'll usually get some information like, Hey, we want to show data particles that represent a Bluetooth connection. So okay, that's great. You know, we have a lot of creative freedom in that. And um, I decided like I'd seen this magnetic dipole effect done before. And I thought that might be a cool approach. So magnetic dipoles, sort of like this image in the background. This is where the, the inspiration kind of came from was um, showing maybe like this image right here. Uh, like we have our um, one of our devices and it is sort of connected by, by, to the phone via these arching lines. So I know that this has been done in Houdini. I've seen people do uh, talks on it. I think Simon Fiedler did a talk about this uh, briefly, uh, maybe a year or so ago. Um, and I just thought, you know, this is a cool time. Maybe I should take a crack at it. So I went and looked around on the internet and like you do, you end up finding um, the formulas. And uh, I, I kind of didn't really know what was going on with some of these formulas, but um, these are what I came up with. I found this one. This is an electric field formula. And more or less, this is a vector that points between the uh, current position in space and one of the charges. And then this is the radius 
of that charge. And this electric field is determined by the ratio of those two squared. And then we have a constant here, which I ended up throwing out, I think, in my example, because it didn't really seem to have an effect. A lot of this is trial and error. So, um, And then in the case of a dipole, since we have two of those, it's just you add this up. So so this first one, you know, this is, uh, this is the positive charge would be E1, and then the negative charge would be E2. So let's get into uh, Houdini to kind of see what this uh, project ends up looking like. All right, so here you can see I've got a setup here. I've got my two, um, I've got my two spheres here, and um, basically, what I want to do is connect those lines coming out of this one and leading into from the one on the left into the one on the right. So. What I found was this, uh, I created a little volume here, uh, just a box volume, and um, initialized it to a, a velocity uh, vector. And then um, I used a volume wrangle here to uh, sort of implement that uh, formula that we were talking about on the other page. So here we've got this, the, the I, I'm just setting the velocity vector equal to that Q1 over um, the radius raised to a power of two, which I'm determining down here. So when we put a volume trail on that, you can kind of see that we have that sort of magnetic field looking result. And so um, more or less, I've just scattered points and I'm trailing them along through that velocity. So if I grab this node and kind of reposition those particles, you can kind of see how they react in this sort of magnetic field looking way. Um, as this uh, wrangle is looking up the point locations of each one of those spheres and then determining those uh, force vectors and the radiuses and doing its thing. Um, all right, so the next step in this setup is to, um, I want to grow these lines. I don't want them to just like already have been appeared like this, but as um, as these spheres are sort of moving apart from one another, I want to have the lines kind of grow on in a random kind of carve like way. So the next uh, node that I had was well, I, I smooth things out, do a little bit of resampling. I create my curve gear at, ugh, I create my curve U attribute and then I do my random carve here. And so this random carve is it, more or less what it does is it just takes this uh, progress slider that I've created down here and it allows you to uh, more or less carve the object by moving the points. If I show the points, you're going to see that it actually is just moving all the points of the spline along the spline. So when I go back here and turn off my points and click play, you can see that we kind of have those splines growing on and then it just kind of grows into that uh, shape that we're after. Cool. And then the next thing I wanted to do was I wanted to have little particles kind of floating or flowing along these splines. Now, because of the way pop, I'm sure that you could do this in a pop sim, but because of the way that these, these lines are kind of moving around and changing position, I didn't know really how the pop sim would interact with that. So I decided to make my own thing that sort of uh, moves the points along those splines on its own. So that would be this thing right here called the point mover. So if I just uh, click play on that, you can kind of see we've got a whole bunch of points. They're all moving along each one of these splines. If we kind of look at what the VEX is doing here, first what we do is we assign a random, random number of points per uh, magnetic line. So we want to have uh, you know a number of points ranging between 100 and 500. Um, say if we wanted to, we could actually have some have only 10 lines, and then if I and, and then this right here is just kind of a distribution of how that uh, random distribution is uh, distributed across those uh, points. So then uh, the next thing that's done is we determine a flow rate for these particles. So you can see that uh, what I wanted to do is I wanted to have a, I wanted to have each spline have its own sort of speed at which the particles, all the particles are moving in their own like random speed range. So that's sort of what this is determining right here. And then within each uh, primitive, I wanted to have the individual particles all have their own speeds as well. Like if I go down here, you can see some of these particles are moving faster than others. But the cool thing is now that this is sort of all locked in, in uh, SOPs. Um, so it's not really, we're not really depending on a particle simulation at all. Um, so and what this basically does is it assigns an ID, it um, determines what the random flow rate is per particle, and then it advances it along by the current frame number. And then it determines its UV position based off of that information using random information from its IDs and the rate per prim and rate 
per particle. It comes up with its UV location on each prim, and then we mod it by one. So basically that's once the particle flows all the way along this curve and goes to the other side, once it goes over one, it just starts back over. That's what the mod one's gonna do for us there. And then we um, get our position vector from the actual spline itself. Then we add the R point in the position of that UV on that spline. And then we set its ID and its curve view attribute. Then we remove the primitive finally. So that's how we end up with something like that. And if I, did, if I turn off the time shift, you can see that all those particles are moving along with those splines. And then uh, what you would end up with is a render based off of this setup that looks like this. Not so great, is it? Um, you can see that we've got a kind of a number of issues going on with this. So the first thing is the line length is uh, inconsistent. You can see these points are all kind of jumping around here and uh, changing their positions on the curve because that volume trail that we're looking at is kind of, you know, it has to reinterpret where the particles are flowing as they change throughout space. And it changes the length of the line and it changes the positions of the particles on the line. So that's something we need to deal with. So that's the first issue. The next issue is um, we have inconsistent endpoints. You can see that these points up here around this sphere, um, they're all just kind of starting in the middle of space, whereas over here, they're kind of converging on a singular point. So I kind of want to like uh, maybe ramp that off and kind of get that all sort of positioned nicely. Um, also, another issue, if you might be able to see right along in here, there's some, you know, some very faint lines that keep popping in and out. What it, what it is, is because we're doing a velocity calculation for motion blur, particles that reach the end are moving back to the beginning point. And that, in, in the difference between those two frames, it's calculating a huge motion blur, uh, a huge velocity and resulting in a huge amount of motion blur. We want to sort of limit that from happening. So that's another issue that we need to deal with. And then um, it's also this, another issue that's kind of hard to see is that from a wider view, some of these lines disconnect. If you keep your eye up here, you can see one of these um, strands is actually disconnecting and the particles are moving in a, are moving backwards. Um, and lastly, uh, I think that the whole motion of this is a little bit rigid in terms of the way the splines themselves are moving. So it'd be nice to add a little bit of secondary motion to that. So here, this is our initial setup right here. This is sort of what I think is like the tutorial, the base concept version of this effect. And over here to the right is the production version of it. And these little purple boxes are things that I did to address those fixes that I mentioned on the previous slide. So if we uh, zoom in right here, uh, you can see, let's just go down this one by one. So what I wanted to do is um, I wanted to, uh, you know, bring these endpoints uh, together and also fix the length of the lines. Now, if I look at this volume trail here and you go, it, it, this sort of illustrates what I'm saying about um, the line uh, ends changing is this, this point where all those uh, volume trails are converging is sort of doing some chaotic stuff here. So what I decided to do was just take this end emitter point, the, the goal point, and use it as a group and delete those points. So now we have just removed all those endpoints. And you can see they're still doing a little bit of jittering around, but we can fix that in the next step. So here we've gotten both of our, um, our line lengths. They should be more consistent, not doing so much chaotic stuff in there. And it's going to make us easier for us to sort of fix what is happening at these endpoints in the next step. So the next step was move the endpoints. So basically I'm just going to go through a uh, for loop on each spline. I'm going to find the first point and the last point, and then I'm going to move them to their goal positions, which is converged on those little areas right at the end there. Cool. So that kind of gets the line length situation uh, sorted out for us. So I'm gonna I'm gonna switch these two on. So now we can see what is going on here. It looks like the points are behaving much more uh, smoothly, and the the these these arcs are looking way more consistent. But this is the issue. The other issue I was talking about was the long line issue, the long arc issue. You can see that based off of what this uh, move endpoint VEX is doing, just basically taking those endpoints and putting them back into the center of those circles, well, we have lines in this uh, in this setup that want to detach themselves 
from the endpoints. If they arc too far out, the volume trail doesn't have enough length in it to bring it all the way back to the uh, to the goal point. So how are we going to deal with that? This is an issue that sort of has come up with uh, for me before. And uh, if I just go up here, I can kind of illustrate that a little bit more. You can kind of see some of these lines. They remove themselves. Some of, and then another one will remove itself and another one and another one. So you'd think, you know, maybe I could just remove the lines that are disconnected, but it, that kind of is always changing. Some of them actually can come, become reconnected as this, uh, as these particles are flowing, as these splines are flowing along. And that's really not what we want. So the way that I came up with to solve this was what I call the kill throughout all time setup. And so I've used this before on products. A lot of times we have a situation where we'll have you know, imagine like a, a shoe that has particles falling on and around it. And what we need is the, the product itself to look clean no matter what in the shot. And we could, you know, try to come up with different ways of deleting particles off of the shoe. Or we could just say that any particle that has hit this shoe at any point in time during the scene, remove it from the uh, scene. And that has worked really well in the past. Um, so I thought, Maybe what I could do is I could kind of backwards that and say any point that removes contact from this end point, I want it to be removed for the entirety of the scene. So this is sort of the next little hack here. Um, what I do is I create a broken attribute and I initialize it to zero. So we know that broken denoting that the line has been broken. Like this would be a broken line, but for our purposes, everything's initialized to zero. And then we jump into a solver. So if I jump into the solver, we can see what's going on here. What happens is we bring in the sphere and we bring in the splines. And if I can just go along here. So we've got our sphere and we've got our splines. And what we're going to do is we're going to create a group out of the points that are um, intersecting with the sphere, just using a you know, group by bounding object. Then what I want to do is I want to promote that group into uh, to primitive level. And you can see that some of these splines that aren't connected don't get promoted to that group because they don't have points that were in that little area over there on the end. So then what we can do is we can do a group combine. And we can say that the broken group is actually everything but the contact group. So I'm more or less just selecting the inverse of what we just had. Then what I want to do is set the broken attribute. So that attribute we initialize uh, up here, I'm going to go in here and say, we're going to take it and we're going to set it to one. So we're using the group as a mask to set the broken attribute to one. Then we're going to merge it with its previous uh, frame over time. So basically I said, uh, we're going to set a value that says, uh, did it ever break? And we're going to look up a primitive value of broken on primnum. And if it ex and then what we're going to say is that the actual broken attribute on our geometry is the maximum of whatever its current broken attribute is and whatever its broken attribute was the previous frame. And it seems confusing, but over time that accumulates and what you're left with is all the broken pieces are gone. You can see before, um, this is a piece that broke and now it's gone. And it looks like this piece hasn't yet broken. Oh, no, it looks like it has broken. But it, even though it has, uh, even though some of these pieces haven't broken, let's look at another one, like, like this one. This piece right here hasn't broken yet back here, but it will break in the future. And you can see that it just removes any and all pieces that have broken from our simulation. So we've cleaned that up using the kill throughout all time setup. Cool, so let's uh, enable that. And then the uh, next thing that we wanted to fix was the motion of this. It's a little bit rigid as it is now. So what we wanted to do, what I uh, like to add to a lot of my setups is my spring solver setup. And basically if we just dive in here and look at what this does, what this does is it's a little solver that um, more or less takes the uh, position of the previous frame, computes a little bit of velocity, and then does more or less a spring uh, a spring equation on it. And then you can set some damping and all that stuff and it kind of results in a smoother motion. So if I go back here, it's gonna highlight that and click play. You can kind of see that smoothing out the motion, just adding a little bit of spring with a lot of damping goes a long way to make this feel a lot more 
organic. You can see it's kind of got like just a more organic bounce to it, which is kind of nice. Cool. So then the only other issue that I think that we had at this point was what was going on with the velocity of the particles that were resetting. You had that motion blur that was really extreme going back to the origin. So let's look at how we're going to fix that part. Um, obviously, we could, we do a trail to compute the velocity, but then what I wanted to do was uh, more or less just use this wrangle to fix the velocity. So it's a really simple setup. All it does is it looks at the... Uh, it, what we do is we offset the we offset the whole thing one frame into the future and then we compare the two values so the uh, v2 vector is simply whatever the velocity of the current point is in the future in the future one frame um, we're going to uh, do a comparison and say if the current speed is greater than the speed of the particle one frame in the future just set its velocity to whatever speed it is one frame in the future. And that sort of gets us around that issue. So if I kind of illustrate this by turning on my trails, my velocity trails, um, you can see we've got some of these particles are just zooming really fast through the center of this uh, project. And then, whereas the rest of them all just sort of have normal velocity vectors. Now, if I turn on this fixed velocity, you can it's kind of hard to see, but that that big velocity vector that was going through the middle of our scene, that green line, has now disappeared, but everything else still has a correct velocity vector on it. And that's it. So once you do that, let's take a look at the result. Um, so you can see that the particles are all sort of moving smoothly. There isn't any crazy streaks. We've, um, you know, sort of like the points converge in a logical way. It has a nice springy motion to it. Um, so this is sort of just a really, uh, I hope this is just sort of a interesting example of how we can take our really basic prototypes and get them into a position where they look um, ready enough to put in an ad for something. All right. So next I wanted to talk about another challenge, which is matching style boards. So another recent project we had was uh, had a bunch of uh, interesting challenges associated with it. And one of them was how we we're going to match uh, certain style boards we had gotten. So uh, what we did was, uh, what happened was we received a Photoshop document that was more or less just a painted version of what you see in this background here. Um, you can just, you, you, you could tell that what happened on the, de, on the uh, agency side was there was just a, the, it, there was a designer that uh, did the pixels. They painted them in, they nudged them around how they wanted them. They got the results they were after. It was pretty standard stuff. Now, full disclosure, this uh, is actually my result for this section. I didn't feel like Photoshopping a fake target frame for the thing I'd already made. So let's just pretend uh, that this is the brief we've received from the client. And now we're tasked with creating this as a particle simulation that flows but holds this target look. Now, that just may seem pretty straightforward at first, but it ended up being a little bit more complicated than uh, we initially thought. So naturally, you might think, okay, I'm going to take this head, you know, all right, we're going to take our input geometry, I'm going to block out my lighting to match that frame, and then I'm going to turn it into a particles, hit sim, light the particles, and we're done. Um, so let's take a look at what that might look like if you were to do that. So what you can see here is we've got our head obviously emitting these particles and we've lit it, but there's absolutely no definition. Or there's no way that this even looks remotely like a head or like the uh, style frame. So we need to investigate this a little bit further. Obviously the particles are not like showing like, I mean, they're reacting to the lights, but there's just no contour of a face in here at all. Um, so I thought it, at this point it would be good to just go back and look at what, maybe we can just try to get this using a basic scatter. Um, you know, let's not sim it for the moment. Let's just try and get there and see what we're dealing with by looking at the particles themselves at, uh, on the emitter. Um, so this is what the head looks like with 300,000 particles. You can see that the lights are picking up over here and that they're uh, picking up over here. But the problem with this is that this is way too dense. So you'd think maybe, well, we can reduce the density and see what that looks like. You know, we want to have some holes in the, in the face. You want to have some particles larger than others. We want it to be a little bit broken up. Um, and this is way too uniform. So reducing the density, you can see we start to lose definition. At 100,000 particles, this almost doesn't look like it's lit at all. It just looks like sort of, I mean, there's a little bit of lighting happening, but it's just more or less, uh, you can't even really tell that that's a face. 
and then reducing it even further to 10,000 particles, which is really closer to our target. You can see that there, there's really uh, no, it's, it's just even harder to tell what's going on. Let me compare that with our style frame. We are very much not there. Um, it looks like this is actually a kind of a combination of these two um, looks that we're after. You can see like we've got the actual lighting showing up over here in our, our frame, but we don't have the, de but we don't have the right density. The density needs to be something more like this. So I'm going to hop over into Houdini and just kind of give an overview of how we conquered uh, this little challenge. All right. So here you can see we got our base geometry for uh, our head of our man that we got off of, um, I think it's a 3D scan. And then we did our pop sim and I got our cache here and you can see that it's just, it looks, there's just no way to tell that that is a person, uh, even if you zoom in and, you know, look really closely at it. So, so this is the thing that we want to fix. Now, the thought that I had was what if we decide, what if instead of using actual lights to light this head, we used lights that, uh, we, we used sort of information about the positions of the lights to adjust what the particle scale was. Uh, um, based off of the these positions of the lights in relation uh, to the body. Um, so over here, I created a couple of points here. I added a point up here and one down here. And these are going to be our new light locations. And um, I'm just going to set an ID for each one. I'm going to call it light ID. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to move it into this for each loop. Now what the for each loop is going to do is it's going to take, uh, well, first off, it's going to copy a sphere onto each light location that has about a million points scattered on it. So you can see that sphere right here. It's just a sphere that has a ton of points scattered on it. And we're actually going to use these points to uh, project rays onto our geometry. So if I um, tick on single pass, you can see that it's taken this uh, light location up here and we are projecting points from that sphere onto the object. It really kind of looks like uh, lighting, more or less. This is taking care of sort of where these uh, particles are appearing on our uh, on the head of our guy here. Um, so what we do is we just, we simply set normals based off of the positions of the particles. You can kind of see we've got the, we've got the normals there. Those normals are all facing away from the light, and then we project them along those normals until they hit the object. And then um, on the ray, what we're doing is we're saying, uh, let's create a ray hit group and inherit the normals of the object that we just hit. So that's how we've got these new normals on all of these particles. Now, if we zoom into this little circle, you can kind of see that there's a little cutout of a head in there that uh, has been projected onto um, this geometry down here. So if I, uh, then, then what's happening here is I want to actually use the normal vector that has appeared here. And I want to uh, also compare it with the light sample direction. So I have a light sample direction vector here in yellow. And now basically what we can do is if we take the dot product between the normal of our new particles that have been projected on here, and uh, we, we do a dot product of that with the direction of the light that it came from, we can create our own uh, illumination attribute and use it to control the specular fall off of our light. So if I just go over here to visualize, I'm going to turn off this visualizer and this visualizer. You can see we have um, this light illumination attribute that we've created here. And now I could actually control, if I remap that, I can control how that light falls off from that dot product just by remapping its range to an attribute like so. And because of the way that this loop is set up, it's designed to create the attribute on the fly based off of whatever its light ID was. So um, if I just set this to uh, not single pass, it will do that for both uh, lights. And you could potentially add as many lights as you want to do this, but for our case, two worked. So. Now what I wanted to do is actually take this uh, particle sim that we had and apply this sort of attri these attributes to it. I'm going to just work with the um, single scatter and not the simulation for right now, just to kind of illustrate this point. But more or less, we're going to do an attribute transfer. We're going to transfer all those light attributes back onto this object, and then we're going to uh, color them like so. So this one is simply this this wrangle right here is just adding 
um, the illumination attributes that we got from each of our particles back together. Then over here, to kind of get a better idea of how that works with lights, if you were to assign an individual color for each one of those attributes, you can see we actually have a much more uh, defined kind of look. We're, we're getting really close to what we had for our style frame based off of this uh, dot product fall off type thingy that we're doing uh, with these attributes. So when I switch this back to our simulation, even though we're simulating all these points right here, um, because we're doing an attribute transfer and kind of masking off just around the areas where this is going to show up, our particles are now kind of flowing through this lighting setup as they pass through this attribute transfer node and pick up those, those lighting attributes. So now that we have those lighting attributes, we can use them to our advantage to kind of create um, more, uh, to, to do a little bit more work to bring this, to bring this thing home. But before we do that, first things first. Now you might notice that um, from this angle, everything's looking uh, pretty good. But if we decide to remove, maybe we say, decide to delete the dark particles. So now we've got many, uh, much less particles. We've had, before what we had was uh, 410,000. Just using this little vex threshold here, I'm just going to kind of blast away uh, particles that drop below a certain black point. You can kind of see that, uh, then you can kind of see through the uh, object. And you can kind of see that depending on what camera angle we're at, we're actually seeing uh, particles that were illuminated on the back end of this guy's head. So the next thing I came up with was a similar trick to try and uh, deal with occluding the back facing geometry of this particle sim. So to do that, um, what I ended up doing was a very similar setup. This time I did it with a grid. I took a grid, I scattered a whole bunch of points on it. I think, yeah, another, another million points onto this grid. And then I looked up our camera. So here, what I've done is I have um, assigned the camera that we have in our scene. So back up at the object level, we have our camera position here. And then if I go back in here, you can say, uh, what I'm doing is I'm gonna look that up and I'm gonna do the op transform more or less. I'm gonna build the transformation ma matrix attribute based off of whatever the transform of this camera is. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the crack transform formula to pull out the vector of the camera position. And then I'm going to create a point there. And um, so if I, you can see uh, I've got my camera here and inside this particle setup, I've now instantiated a point right at the, uh, right where the camera is, the right where the camera lens is. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy this grid with this scatter onto those points and just offset it a little bit. So you can see we've kind of got this projection going on in front of the camera. If I hop into that camera, you can see it's kind of covering my entire field of view. Um, now what I wanted to do is um, I wanted to project along the normal. So I'm going to create a normal attribute for each one of these points that's based off of its current position minus the position of that camera point that we had uh, created up here. And so if I hop over, if I hop out of this real quick, and kind of uh, show the normals, you can see that the normals of all those points are pointing away from the center of that camera lens. Cool, so next thing to do, we just project it back onto that geometry like we did before. And you can see that it punches out a little hole in all those points as it projects it onto this head. And if we go back around this head, you can see that it kind of shadows itself nice. It's almost like there's a spotlight on the, uh, on the camera that is um, sort of casting a shadow or casting light onto the uh, geometry of this man's face. Um, and then the next thing we want to do is we're just going to delete the ray group and then create the camera shadow attribute. And the camera shadow attribute, we're just going to initialize it to one, basically saying any particle that is in this system is a camera shadow attribute. And we're going to use an attribute transfer to mask off where the other particles were. So if I go over here, and turn on visualize, you can see our, our, our mass camera attribute is only uh, these particles, but there's other particles that are occluded from view that we want to mask. So if we throw in the mask cam shadow, you can now see that we can't see through this. Now, if I hop through into my camera position, lock my camera and change position, it is reprojecting those particles onto the face and masking out the particles that are facing away from us. So I can kind of do a little bit of before, whoops, I'm gonna do a little bit of a uh, before and after. If I turn this off, you can see through the head, turn it on, you can't. You can see as I tumble, it takes a second and just updates. 
This is one of those things. There's, there's probably a better way to do this, but whatever. It ended up working for this project. So I thought that was kind of cool. With that out of the way, the rest of this is just uh, the normal cleanup. We're going to randomize the scale of the particles. We're we're going to randomize the scale of the particles based off of the um, you know just based off of its ID attribute. Then what we want to do is re-enable some random particles so that it isn't just like fully constrained to the areas where this uh, light these lighting attributes have hit the geometry. So I'm just going to turn some of those back on. And then um, I want to scale them by the color, which we've we've which we've determined here. Um, based off of those lighting attributes. So we've got particle scale based off of color. And if we kind of look at that, you can kind of see what we're looking like here. Um, just using a little sprite attribute to kind of show we got this random scale going on. So if you just check out a playbook of this real quick, you can see kind of the issue here with just taking this setup raw is that it's got this popping on and off that happens as these particles are traveling through this uh, illumination attribute. Um, some of them are, are jumping into illumination and jumping out of illumination really quickly. And therefore, they kind of their P scale is uh, being adjusted very, very drastically. So the way I like to get around that is I just hacked my own spring setup. Let's look at light zero, for example. If I just go in here and we look at this, basically what I did was instead of using vectors to determine like the springiness of the positions uh, between the uh, different points in time, um, I just set it all to floats and told it to um, adjust the P scale uh, accordingly. Um, now right here you can see I actually modified that up top to put in any old attribute. Put in light zero for this one, put in light one for that one, and then I, I did it for the overall P scale as well just um, because I ended up using these individual light attributes in my rendering setup as well. So I just did, I just did, I just added damping to all of these things and then cached it out. So you can see those particles gradually drift on and then fade and sort of vaguely adhere to this shape of this head in a way that very much looks like a particle simulation, but also very much looks like it is being illuminated by real lights. But it's not. It's cool. We've actually used fake lighting setup to kind of, you know, trick our shader, or our, our particles, our P scale values into acting as if they were um, affected by some sort of lights. All right, and uh, as we go into the last section of the presentation, I just wanted to share a project breakdown of a cool project that we worked on recently for Malibu Boats 2020 digital campaign. Basically, what we were doing was we were going through a um, we we're going through a factory in a kind of an abstract way and forming the elements of this boat. So uh, before we get into the full on breakdown, let's take a look at what that what the final product looked like. So for this project, um, a couple of coworkers flew out to the factory where they make uh, this stuff and grabbed some reference. You can see here, this is uh, some fiberglass and fiberglass seems like it comes in a couple different forms. One of them is this like sort of dusty, fibery kind of uh, crystallized looking form. And the other one is this very organized sort of almost like a carbon fiber uh, pattern look to it. Um, but we wanted to also kind of incorporate this fiberglass look with the resin look. Basically, the fiberglass is like spread over the surface and then um, resin is applied to the fiberglass. So that was sort of our challenge and the type of thing that we were after in this project. Um, so R&D. 
uh, what we did was we kind of looked at this and tried to recreate um, ele these elements in 3D the best we could. More or less in my world, that was uh, creating a lot of splines, a way to make the splines grow, and then instancing little tiny crystals all over them to try and achieve this type of look that you see on the left here. So here's a couple other examples of of, uh, of shots that we created trying to recreate the fiberglass effect. Some macros of those little crystals. Um, this is sort of a combination of that carbon fiber weaving pattern in the middle here with the crystals on the outside and the more uh, randomly scattered fibers all around the outside of the screen. Um, and then a zoom in uh, close up of that uh, weaving going on. And then when it came time to apply the resin, we wanted to come up with some other abstract effects to apply the resin to the fibers. So we did this sort of um, pyro simulation. It was a pyro simulation with uh, gravity, and then we just meshed it and then advected bubbles through it. Um, also, um, I knew that in my career it was only a matter of time before a client had requested the a remake of Dave Stewart's uh, famous invisible paintbrush goop simulation. And so this is sort of my take on that, um, but hat tip to you, Dave. That was uh, obviously a clear source of inspiration for a shot like this. Um, so yeah, resin pouring, um, this paint brushing, uh, resin spreading effect. Um, this pyro uh, down here, pyro effect, and then also, of course, the the fiber weave. Um, these are just uh, sort of the next phase in the R&D is uh, kind of get it rendered and see what it looks like. So I just wanted to do a quick little breakdown of one of the shots that I thought was kind of fun, and that was the power wedge liquid metal formation. Um, I'll often get a brief like, we need this to form out of welded liquid metal. And but there's no welder and the parts need to come out of nowhere. And so then I kind of just get to figure out what that might look like. And it's a lot of freedom and it's, it's really fun to kind of sort those things out. So I'm going to kind of talk through my thought process on this shot. You can see it's this sort of hot glowing welded end, some sparks and just forming what is the power wedge. The power wedge is actually a little like underwater spoiler that comes out of the back of the boat that help, helps keep the boat uh, the re the back end of the boat um, down into the water so it creates a bigger wake so that you can, you know, wakeboard. And if you're wakeboarding, you get like, you can get more air off the wake because it's, it's got a steeper uh, slope to it. But yeah, um, so this is the effect I wanted to kind of go over how I came about um, making it. So let's go on to see what that was like. Okay. Yeah. So in the development phase, I thought to myself, well, cool. What we could do is we could just flip gravity upside down and create an inverted uh, collider out of this thing and just sort of fill it up with fluids and uh, adding some extra divergence to a flip sim and filling it up from the bottom to the top. Because if gravity is facing upwards, this is the actual, this is actually the bottom of it up here. But, um, yeah, adding some divergence to the emitter, it caused it to fill up and then fully encapsulate more or less the shape of that power wedge piece of geometry. But you can see there's some problems with it. There's some vortical or, you know, kind of swirling going on over here. And it just generally isn't like the perfect shape of the power wedge. So the next step that I would do to um, make that look better is I would do the Boolean fluid surface. I basically take that fluid sim and then I Boolean it using the new Boolean that's it's been in there, it's been in Houdini for the last couple of versions, but it's super solid. And I use that Boolean to kind of create a clean outer shell to that fluid simulation. You can see that it forms the geometry perfectly. And we also get the UVs back so that we can have like our power wedge texture on there and everything. Um Another thing uh, while doing the while we're on the topic of booleans is I added a boolean seam as well. So you can kind of see that here. The boolean seam kind of travels along with that fluid sim right on the edge of where the original fluid sim meets the actual geometry. Um, so that that was this this comes in handy a lot later on when we start to do things like use it to create the hot attribute. So wherever that Boolean seam was, I was transferring the attributes of its location back onto the uh, power wedge here and using it to create this hot falloff, which is that red attribute that you can see there. That red attribute was then used 
as a scatter for pop fluids. And then this is, this is how we're going to create that sort of magma like stuff. Pop fluids has been really great for sort of large scale surface tension setups. Previously, like using surface tension and flip is really, um, is really amazing, but it's really hard to do at scales that are like more than just a couple droplets and this since this is pretty large pop fluids ended up being perfect for this and it simmed really fast and it gave us a nice little globular kind of shapes that we were after and then this is just a visualization of the age fall off for the heat um in that kind of magma liquid metal uh that that sort of like liquid metal uh form that it has the next thing would be if it's if we're welding, we got to have sparks. So similarly, use the um, boolean seam as the source for the emitter for uh, this, and then just use a really high substep um, pop sim. I think it was like eight substeps. That's high for me. Um, eight substep pop sim with some uh, really high frequency noise so that these um, trails that we created here weren't so linear. They kind of have a little bit of erratic um, curling to them. Then the next thing was to apply a, a wet map based off of that leading Boolean seam edge. And that wet map just is a kind of a fall off to kind of show the, um, the, the metal cooling down. Um, you can see down in the lower right hand corner the UV space version of that. So that wet map was uh, sent through COPS and output as a uh, emission texture that we used in our final shader. And then nextly, uh, you can kind of see all those elements coming together here, but all of these, all these things, the sparks and the, um, the liquid and everything was used as a source for another pyro simulation just to kind of add some smoke to uh, the shot. And lastly, I just wanted to uh, kind of wrap the whole thing up with a behind the scenes view of that spot, just because there's a bunch of cool clay renders that we uh, like to do to kind of show some of the process that goes into making, um, making these uh, spots. <laughs> So that is it for my presentation. I just wanted to say thank you all for checking it out and I will catch you next time.